When the current state of emergency in Ontario was announced earlier this month, the province pledged that, quote, strong new measures will be enforced. What that meant exactly was not clear then. Now that we're a week into it, have the expectations of police and their enforcement rule become more clear? Let's ask. In Burlington, Ontario, Scott Mills, Strategic Communications Coordinator for Ontario Provincial Police Association. In Ajax, Ontario, Kanika Samuels-Wortley, Assistant Professor at Carleton University's Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice. And in the provincial capital, Dr. Nahid Dosani, a palliative care physician, health justice activist, and professor at McMaster University in Hamilton. And Abby Deshman, Criminal Justice Program Manager at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association. Hi to you all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know you are all very busy uh, and we appreciate your time. Um, I want to set the table of our conversation by basically asking you all the same question. Scott, I want to start with you. When the Ontario government announced its latest stay-at-home messaging, uh, what were your initial thoughts, Scott? My initial thoughts is uh, we were going to have to stay in our houses and uh, um, basically uh, uh, live at home and uh that was basically it. Um, I, I, I felt like it was uh, um, the situation had gone to a point where there was some really serious uh, um, orders from the government that were coming down. Were you surprised to hear that the police will be involved in enforcing those stay-at-home orders? Uh, no, I wasn't surprised. Um, that's what that's what law enforcement does uh, day in and day out is uh, uh, police uh, the laws that the that the government makes. And Kanika, what how did you interpret the latest uh, stay at home measure when you first heard it over a week ago? Well, I found that the rules were a bit confusing. We weren't sure. Uh, we had figured that we were in a, a lockdown, so it 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 didn't. Uh, makes sense that we had a, a additional measures, which I think most of us thought we already were going through. So with rules that uh, are, are quite uh, confusing and, and continue to be confusing for the general citizen, I, I just can only imagine for uh, police as well that that allows a level of confusion. And uh, that, that potentially, and without kind of formal criteria to what uh, should be implemented and, and, and the particular measures and the particular individuals who should be stopped, um, and questioned and potentially fined, um, it, it, it opens doors for a level of inconsistencies and, and, and discretions that, uh, that might be problematic. And uh, so it, it, it really is quite confusing as to um, what, what can be done, what we can do. And I, I suspect it's the same for police services as well. And Dr. Dosani, what was your impression? You know, as a science and evidence-based um, health worker who wants to bring an end to COVID-19, I, I saw the merits of a stay-at-home order and um, and people, um, you know, seeing the merits of this kind of uh, state of emergency. But as a physician and health worker who provides health care for racialized communities, often low-income racialized people, my mind went to a totally different place about um, what over-policing has done to the people I care for, for Black and Indigenous people, for other racialized people in our communities. And and um, there is a long-standing history of over-policing in low-income racialized neighborhoods where many of our essential workers live and work. Uh, we know that this is not an equal opportunity virus. Um, in the first wave, 83% of people in the Toronto area that were affected were racialized people. We know that policing is not an equal opportunity experience. Racialized people are over-targeted and over-profiled. And um, it it, given the confusion that even police leaders were stating um, the day after, um, this was not a good combination of things. And so I continue to be concerned about over-policing and, you know, I'm worried that we are returning to policing in a pandemic, which I appreciate there needs to be an element of that, but we can't police our way to back to public health and we can't police our way out of this pandemic. And Abby, what were your impressions? So very similar. Um, concerned and eager to see the legal details, right? Often we get uh, the political communication announcements first, uh, the regulations and legal details follow. And as a lawyer, I always want to see the actual law. And um, the message stay at home is very simple, uh, very compelling. 
actually doing that is very complex. There are all kinds of people that need to leave their houses for many, many, many reasons. And figuring out exactly what those details are, what the law says, um, and if there is scope and space for you know, the people who don't have a safe home, the people who are living on the streets, the, the people that are essential workers, the people who need to travel to get their kids to and from childcare, um, or other family members, life is complex. And uh, it's often in the minor details of the law that um, we really know how these orders are going to impact people and, and whether there will be disproportionate um, and ultimately discriminatory policing um, that follows. And Scott, um, you know, you are uh, representing the police and I don't want you to feel as if we're uh, putting all of this on you. We wanted you to be on the show because we really do want to get an, I an idea and understanding of what is happening because when the um, Premier announced these stay-at-home orders, we kept hearing, you know, if it's an essential trip, you can make that essential trip. But there was no clear definition of what essential was. And you've heard some of the guests say uh, it was confusing. And we've been hearing that from people who are watching to show that this is very confusing. You, the police, also um, have had um, people call 911 asking um, what the message meant. So um, have the police been left to decide for citizens what an essential outing is? Well, it, it is clearly defined in the, in, in the order. And um, I think it, it was just a matter of getting it communicated out there. And uh, everything in, in COVID uh, happens fast. And, and there's a lot of changes. And and it's quite understandable that uh, that people don't know uh, up from down these days, um, it, you know, including sometimes the, the police officers that are uh, out there uh, tasked to enforce and the bylaw officers. Um, keep in mind, we're all human beings, too, in law enforcement. Uh, we all have families. Um, we're all living through this as well. Um, a police officer or a, law, a bylaw officer, the last thing they want to do is go out and and cause misery to uh, add misery to a to an open wound. Uh, we're all suffering uh, at this time, um, and uh, but th there has to be an enforcement um, aspect to any law that, that that's implemented. Um, so I I just I uh, I hear what what the other uh, people. Uh, guests that you have here are saying and and I think it's important to acknowledge what they're saying and, and not dismiss what's being said in any way shape or form um, uh, but I think that it everything that I'm seeing on the law enforcement and there's trying to be a measured response and there's trying to be um uh, a response that's reflective of the need yet at the same time um, is not going out to target uh, specific communities or, or anything like that. I haven't seen anything like that. I haven't heard of anything like that happening. Um, the government, I believe, is trying to target the behavior of gatherings and, and getting together and, and their goal is an admirable goal and it's to stop the spread of COVID-19 and keep us alive. Some people don't want to listen to that and that's where the enforcement piece comes in. I just want to clear, because you said that um, it's pretty clear the essential part of it, but there are people who are uh, frontline workers. Um, when we say stay at home, um, there's a lot of people, I guess, in this context, it is a privilege to be able to stay home and do your job at home. Um, but there's a lot of people who are, working, who are working on the front lines who have to go into work. And we've been reading articles and seeing studies come out. It's affecting uh, certain communities. Do you think, though, that maybe the government should have been more clear as to what an essential trip means? Scott. Um, well, it, it, it's hard to say. I think, I think if, you, if you actually look at the legislation, um, it, it, it is pretty clear um, about um, what can and can't be done. And it is reasonable. Um, there are exceptions for people's daily lives um, that are basically common sense of, uh, exceptions. So I, I really think that we have to look at this in terms of common sense, in terms of this is a temporary uh, measure. Um, it, it's, we all need to do our part. 
and um, uh, the the police are in it with the community. Uh, the law enforcement officers are with our community. We are part of our community. We don't want this to go on any more than anybody else. And um, please work with us. Um, we don't want to put ourselves at risk um, enforcing uh, this type of thing. Um, so the more that we have compliance and uh, um, communication about what's reasonable and what's happening, uh, the better. Uh, police aren't knocking on your door and, and, and dragging you out of your house for breaking rules. That's not happening. Um, uh, Dr. Dasani, I want to pose this question to you. Scott says that it is clear as to what essential, uh, what the stay-at-home order is. What do you think are the gaps in the public's understanding of the order? Because it does seem that there is some confusion. Well, I mean, I think just to respond to some of the comments, we must remember that the notion that policing impacts our communities equally is just simply not true. Um, we, I live in a city where black people are 20 times more likely to be shot. Um, that's that's deadly force. There's there's a history of profiling. We have a history of carding on the basis of poverty. We live in a province and country where the criminalization of people experiencing homelessness is very real. I'm a doctor who pr provides health care for people experiencing homelessness. The people I care for experience that. We have a history of criminalizing communicable disease. Just ask people who have uh, uh, who deal with HIV. So, you know, staying at home is a privilege and what's lacking in the communication is the nuanced approach of, of the experience of those who don't have that privilege. The people who don't have a home, people who don't have money in their bank account, account people who don't have caregivers to support them. And so when our politicians say that, we lack that understanding and our essential workers are dealing with that. So in our communications approach, a lot of the time Th things are communicated in documents that are online or at press conferences in the middle of the day where many people, essential workers, the racialized people, low-income uh, workers are typically at work. They don't consume information that way. We have we have had a one-size-fits-all approach to communication for too long in this pandemic, and we are not um, approaching this in a, in, a, in a health literate way for people who may not have that literacy. We're not thinking about different languages. We're not thinking about different media and social media platforms. Many of the racialized people I care for in the South Asian community get their information from WhatsApp or other social media platforms. And that's why I'm so proud of colleagues at organizations like the South Asian Health Network who have, who have come together to create communications for these communities. But why does it take community advocates to do this? Our governments need to step up and provide more equitable approaches to communication. Um, Kanika, do you think that, what do you think the public should know about what the police can or cannot do in this current stay-at-home order. I I would actually leave it to my colleague to uh, to to answer to what uh, the public should expect or what they can and cannot do when they encounter police. I I simply wanted to respond to my colleague in terms of how uh, police uh, surveillance and attention tends to uh, be on Black, Indigenous, and and, and racialized communities. And the fear with these increased orders and this increased police powers is that this is simply giving another tool in, in, in the police officer's toolbox to randomly stop an individual in, in the name of public health orders. Um, so we are afraid that history is going to continue to repeat itself. Um, so even though um, the police are not on, are not supposed to stop you um, randomly uh, uh, without cause. There, there is now this opportunity to use a public health order in order to do that. Um, however, I would leave it to my colleague Abby to to answer to um, what it is and and what are the rights of an individual who is stopped by police. Abby, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, the baseline uh, for everybody is that you do not have to talk to the police. Uh, constitutional rights uh, are still in force and you have the right to silence. Um, having said that, though, you know, we do have uh, increased police powers that have come with COVID uh, as a consequence of COVID emergency orders. So if a police officer um, has reasonable and probable grounds to believe that you are in violation of one of the COVID orders, they can demand you that you identify yourself. Um, and you know, that does mean uh, usually either saying your name, your address, date of birth. Um, we've definitely heard from people that they have been told they need to produce identification. Uh, if they don't have it, they've been asked to phone a family member, uh, get a text fixture of um, their ID at home. Right? So these are increased police 
powers. And I think the concern is uh, police are not in, in uniform contact with uh, people in my city across the province, right? We do have greatly increased um, police contact with racialized people, uh, black individuals, indigenous people, people living on the streets. So when you layer these additional uh, powers, these additional um, orders uh, on top, and, and the police are going to be primarily enforcing them in the context of their current policing duties, it, those policing duties disproportionately burden certain communities. And the real risk um, is that these COVID orders will also disproportionately burden Black uh, racialized communities. So, um, and from our perspective, you know, it is a hard ask for police. Uh, we actually don't think it's um, a very useful ask for police uh, to try to enforce our way out of a pandemic. Um, how should we the approach it then? Not to interrupt you, but how should we approach this? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, we have examples of jurisdictions in Canada that did not rely on enforcement um, in the first wave of COVID and very effectively flattened the curve. Uh, BC uh, issued very, very few, few tickets. Um, in fact, they specifically told their um, law enforcement police officers, bylaw officers, that they were not to be involved in the policing of the public health orders. So this is about communication. It is about supports. It is about things like, you know, do you have sick days that you can take that are paid? Are you worried about you know, your job still existing um, if you take two weeks off to self-isolate. What are your childcare options? Right? Really looking at the supports that people have in order to comply with very difficult uh, public health recommendations and orders, rather than relying on punitive tools like enforcement uh, and fines and punishment. Um, and I think it, that's a hard message for people to understand. Lots of people intuitively think, you know, if we put out rules and then we follow them up with punishments, that's going to ensure compliance. And the truth is, um, people's lives are much more complicated than that. Um, and changing the human behavior uh, doesn't really work that way. Well, the province has said that this is now the law. And Dr. Dasani, um, I noticed you wanted to jump in. Yeah, you know, I really agree with those um, statements. I think it's really um, it's really um, uh, understandable that people in the public might say, okay, just stay at home and we need more law enforcement. But what we're lacking and why I'm so disappointed in the government's response up until this point and why we're not seeing case counts drop in the way we're hoping is because we're not addressing the social underpinnings of what are causing more COVID-19 cases in our communities. And that is a significant proportion of cases coming from our essential workers who are simply going to work and have to choose between going to work and paying their bills and their health. And it is so disappointing to see that despite activists, um, health professionals, and a concerned public asking our province for paid sick leave, that we continue to get gaslighted about the idea that that paid sick leave is a federal responsibility. We all know that the federal program for paid sick leave doesn't pay out the same way. It doesn't pay out in the same amount and there are significant delays in payment. So it's a higher threshold and barrier that many people just can't use. It also requires you to take more than 50% of the week off for work to get access to. And that doesn't really work for those who just need to take a day to be sick or go get a COVID test. So, you know, paid sick leave decent wages and workplace protections are so important. We live in a province where over 7,600 cases have happened in um, factories, production plants. Um, and up until recently, we only had one employer fined. Where is the accountability on employers? And I do understand inspections are happening more. And see, we're getting at the social underpinnings of health inequities that are leading to more COVID-19 cases. And so law enforcement is just a superficial kind of discussion. We need to be digging at the roots. Um, and Scott, you know, earlier on, uh, I don't I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to what Dr. Dasani said. Um, Is it superficial? It's it's not. I, I don't want to dismiss what anybody's saying because because everybody has a viewpoint and, and their viewpoints need to be listened to and respected. Um, that includes that includes the police, and I think the police um, get get painted with a large brush here. Um, we're, we're we're just a, a minor element in this entire big picture of, of the COVID situation. And there are a lot of us out there in law enforcement that are working very, very hard to help people in need. Um, 
you know. And I don't think anyone, uh, Scott, I don't think anyone is disputing it. Um, earlier on, yeah. you said that this is about uh, making sure uh, you break up uh, public gatherings. But this past, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, anti-mask uh, protesters, especially like this past week in, uh, in Toronto. Um, and we saw them breaking the order in a very public manner. Um, but then we've also heard reports that um, a mother of four uh, being stopped and being fined, and I, I believe her fine was $880, and she was fined for bringing her kids to their grandparents for babysitting. Isn't that just poor, like extremely bad optics for the police? Um, I, I'm told there, there's always, I think we have to very much keep it in perspective that there's always two stories uh, two sides to every story, and then there's the truth. And um, I think um, some things make it into the media and be and become an issue, uh, like the issue that you're re you're referring to. And I think there is more to the story um, that isn't being reported on. You know, the, these 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 are tickets. These are uh, these are like getting a, a speeding ticket. Their provincial offense act matters, and and generally um, police communications. Uh, don't comment and identify people to the media um, on provincial offense act matters. They're not criminal matters, right? So, but people did see. I think, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, though. Um, people did see the anti-mask uh, protesters and the police. Um, at the end of, uh, I think the next day, they did say that they gave out tickets. The number of tickets, I don't know if they added up to the amount of people who were uh, at the protest. Um, I, a lot of politicians have been uh, challenged with the messaging uh, behind the pandemic, and trust has come up a lot. Do you think that maybe this is more of a trust uh, issue between the public and the police? Um, I, for, for certain people, there's always a trust issue between the public and the police. For others, there isn't. It, it, it's very subjective about about who you are and what your situation is. Uh, in relation to the anti-maskers, um, the rules are in place to stop that type of thing. It's, it's uh, police officers and, and bylaw officers and anybody doing enforcement at an anti-masker protest are putting themselves at risk. Um, th these people should be looked at, uh, looked upon as, as, as community heroes trying to keep us safe, um, not, uh, not in a light of of their coming to racially profile us at an anti-mask demonstration. Um, the police are really uh, looking at the behavior. Um, they're not looking at people's skin color in relation to this. The police don't want to be out there having to do this job any more than anybody else does during these times. And um, I just hope that... that um, that, that issues aren't getting conflated. Um, this is a temporary measure. Uh, the police have been asked to do enforcement. Um, they're doing the best job that they can given the circumstances and limited resources. Um, and we're all trying to keep ourselves safe. And if I could just make a, a, a plea for calm and, and not to conflate issues, um, I think I think most law enforcement people would, would want that to be said. Can you explain the four E's of uh, engage, explain, educate, enforce of policing, uh, what you're generally using in a police stop situation? So, so the police aren't, aren't stopping um, people in cars to enforce these orders. That's, that woman, that's the mother, not, um, not to interrupt again, but that mother says that she was stopped by the police when she was in a car. So would you, would you, the, would you agree that maybe some of this stuff is happening? Anything, anything is possible. And uh, I, I don't want to dismiss anybody's viewpoint. Uh, anything is possible. I wasn't at that situation. I don't, I haven't been briefed fully on that situation. I just uh, want people to um, understand that, that there's always more than one side to any story. Abby? So there are lots of ways that the police um, 
have to stop cars, right? Even outside of the COVID orders, um, police have a really broad authority to stop a car, ask a driver for a license um, and identification. So uh, this is, it could be, you know, police making a lawful stop under the Highway Traffic Act, and then also inquiring about COVID tests. This is, you know, one of the ways that these orders can get layered on top of existing police powers. And um, there was another uh, media release um, that went out, uh, said a uh, police service stopped a suspicious car uh, with no explanation of what suspicious meant, and then they asked more questions of the passengers. Passengers identified themselves. They ended up getting um, COVID-related fines and no other charges, right? This is one of, uh, you know, the ways that these fines can be layered on top of existing police patterns, existing police powers, um, and disproportionately impact um, the same people who are disproportionately policed right now. But I, I do want to say that I think actually the approach to enforcement in Ontario um, has um, been restrained in comparison to, uh, for example, Quebec, right? I think it was very useful to um, have the clarification that police would not have the power to stop people um, in cars solely to check um, if they are violating COVID orders, would not have the ability to uh, demand uh, justifications from people as to why they are out and about. Um, people would not be required to have notes from uh, healthcare providers or their employers. Those were very useful clarifications. And I, I think we've seen a different approach in Quebec, frankly, um, where there is a curfew uh, and the premier there is saying, you know, yeah, homeless people need to, uh, people experiencing homelessness need to abide by the curfew. Um, and we have had reports of people uh, with no safe place to go um, being fined uh, very, very steep fines. That is um, a really unhelpful approach. And I I'm glad uh, that we haven't seen that um, in Ontario. And I, I I think that's something that um, we should be thankful for. Uh, Kanika, what should someone do if they feel like they're being unfairly fined or, or charged? See, that's that's um, kind of an issue at hand right now when we speak to um, accountability. Um, at the moment, when an individual feels that they have been um, mistreated uh, by the police, there is very little that... Um, that they have um, recourse or that they have for them because they essentially have to go to the police to make a complaint against the police. Um, so in this instance, uh, sorry, again, I'm going to have to leave that to Abby as, as she would be uh, better suited to answer as to what is available to um, citizens who feel that they have been mistreated by police. But at the current moment, there really doesn't seem to be um, much of an opportunity for a citizen to, to state uh, or, or to have that um, opportunity to make that complaint uh, simply because you're complaining to the police. Um, and, and, and generally, uh, there, there does not tend to be a, a great deal of accountability uh, when a citizen comes to complain against uh, the police themselves. Uh, so, Abby, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, what should someone do if they feel like they are being unfairly fined or charged? Yeah, so people have the right to contest these tickets. Um, and certainly during the first wave of COVID, we um, were in touch with dozens and dozens of people who were ticketed, um, you know, when their kid ran and jumped up on a park bench uh, or um, because they were standing one foot inside of a unmarked uh, soccer field, right? So lots of people felt um, that they had uh, been unfairly targeted or received very... Um, uh, you know, really tickets that were unrelated to public health goals. Um, people have the right to contest those tickets. Um, right now, I haven't heard of anybody actually getting a trial date. Things are very, very backlogged um, in the justice system. But these tickets are more akin to speeding tickets than they are to, you know, criminal code offenses. Um, you'll probably be able to find a, a neighbor or a family member that's thought about contesting a speeding ticket. Um, certainly, you can get in touch with the Canadians of the Liberties Association. We have a forum up on our website to try and keep track of how these tickets are playing out. Um, and eventually, uh, there will be an opportunity um, for you to go and explain the circumstances um, and why you think that the particular ticket was unfair. Um, I, I cannot believe it, but uh, we've run out of time. <laughs> I think we have to pick up this conversation uh, soon, and we really do appreciate your time. I know you're all very busy. Thank you so much for joining us on the agenda tonight. Thank you Thank very you much for having us.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.